Hi guys, it is another gloomy, stormy day here in the end times in paradise on Sunday morning, May 29th, 2016, where we have no power. The collapse of global industrial civilization has begun here on St. Croix Virgin Islands apparently. And so I have been reduced without my little electric umbilicus to the rest of the planet to reading a book. Now I know the young the youngsters listening to this have probably never heard of one of these things. This is called a book. Book. B-O-O-K. It's made of paper and it's printed with this stuff called ink ink on paper. You ought to check one of these things out. If you open one of these things, just since you've probably never encountered one of these, uh, what you do is you open it like this and you start, I know this sounds complicated, but you'll get used to it. You start in the upper left corner and you read across to the right so when you get to the end of this line, you don't continue over. I know this sounds crazy, but when you get to here, you drop down to here. Are you following this pattern? So your eye starts here, and you go like this. And then when you get to the very bottom right corner of this page, then you, you take your eye and you go up to the top left corner of this page and you repeat the process until you get to this point. Now when you get to this point what you do is called turn the page and then you start the process again so you ought to check one of these things out they're called books so this is what we used to do here us, us old fogies back uh, in the Pleistocene we used to read these things and so, this is not exactly a Bible of the Apocalypse that uh, I have discovered, but it is, it, it is a damn good read. So if you're looking for some, some good summer reading and don't really want to hear about the collapse of a planet, highly recommend this book. And I guess it's the first in a series, so I can look forward to more of them, called Flash Man by a fellow named George McDonald Fraser. Uh, hilarious. Hilarious. Uh, anywho, what I'm going to do here, since I've got nothing else to do with myself in paradise, i got 11 days to fill up here, guys. I am going to read about this... Uh, <clears throat> What this book is about, it, it takes place, I think this is, is about eight, from 1840, uh, I, I'm guessing. It's, it's a little unclear when, when the year is here, but this is a loosely historical novel from the United Kingdom uh, around 1840 following the misadventures of this uh, unlikely anti-hero um, this guy this guy flashman so anyway let's call it 1840 and so this is our young flashman he's been basically kicked out of, of England for his his behavior and sent to Scotland to teach him a lesson so that this young man, I think he's 18 or 19 years old at this point, shows up in Scotland. And I am just going to read the first couple of pages. And what this is for anybody who thinks that the police state, the police state that uh, everyone from Alex Jones to Chris Hedges to David Icke, always talking about that this is some sort of new development where, where the, the governments in the pockets of industry, uh, th that the police force is put in force not to protect the people, but 
the factory owners and the industrialists. That is what the, the military's job is to control, to control the scoundrels, meaning the people. And so anyone who thinks this is some, some new development, let's go turn the clock back to, let's call it 1840, and hear what was going on in, in, in Scotland. Um, no, I'm not going to attempt to use uh, a, a, Scottish, a Scottish accent here. Okay, take it away. George MacDonald Fraser and explain to us the police state circa 1840. <clears throat> I have soldiered in too many countries and known too many people to fall into the folly of laying down the law about any of them. I tell you what I have seen, and you may draw your own conclusions. I disliked Scotland and the Scots, the place I found wet and the people rude. They had the fine qualities which bore me, thrift and industry and long-faced holiness, and the young women are mostly great, genteel, boisterous things who are no doubt bedworthy enough if your taste runs that way. One acquaintance of mine who had a Scotch clergyman's daughter described it as like wrestling with a sergeant of dragoons. The men I found solemn, hostile, and greedy, and they found me insolent, arrogant, and smart. This for the most part. There were exceptions, as you shall see. The best thing I found, however, with a port in the Clare claret or claret in which the scotch have a nice taste although i never took the whiskey the place i was posted to was paisley which is near glasgow and when i heard of the posting i as near as a toucher sold out but i told myself i should be back with the 11th in a few months and must take my medicine even if it meant being away from all decent living for a while my forebodings were realized and more, but at least life did not turn out to be boring, which is what I had feared most. Very far from it. Okay, so at this time, let's call it 1840, there was a great unrest throughout Britain in the industrial areas, which meant very little to me, and indeed, I've never troubled to read up on the particulars of it. The working people were in a state of agitation, and one heard of riots in the mill towns, and of weavers smashing looms, and chartists being arrested. But we younger fellows paid it all no heed. If you were country bred or lived in London, these things were nothing to you. And all I gathered was that the poor folk were mutinous and wanted to do less work for more money. And the factory owners were damned if they would let them. There may have been more to it than this, but I doubt it. And no one has ever convinced me that it was anything but a war between the two. It always has been and always will be as long as one man has what the other has not. And devil take the hindmost. <clears throat> the devil seem to be taking the workers, by and large, with government helping him, helping the devil. The devil seem to be taking the workers, by and large, with the the Scottish, meaning the, the British crown, helping the devil, and we soldiers were the government's sword. <clears throat> Troops were called out to subdue the agitators, and the riot act was read. And here and there, there would be clashes between the two, and a few killed. I am fairly neutral now, with my money in the bank, <clears throat> but at that time, <coughs> everyone I knew was damning the workers 
up and down and saying they should be hung and flogged and transported and I was all for it as the Duke would say <clears throat> you have no notion today how high feelings ran the mid folk meaning the middle class were the enemy then as though they had been Frenchmen or Africans <clears throat> They were to be put down wherever they rose up, and we, meaning the, the soldiers from the federal government, were to do it. I was hazy enough, as you see, on the causes of it all, but I saw further than most in some ways, <clears throat> and what I saw was this. It's one thing leading British soldiers against foreigners, but would they fight <coughs> their own folk? This is uh, Alex Jones. Th this is a continuing theme running through Alex Jones and, uh, and Chris Hedges. A at what point are the cops, are the cops gonna say, we are not going to, uh, you know, to raise our swords against our fellow man. At what point uh, are, are, is the police state simply going to say, we're done with it? Well, what's true for 2016 was every bit as true in, in 1840. Uh, you know, this is the Alex Jones and Chris Hedges of 1840. Would they fight their own folk? For most of the troopers of the 11th Brigade, for example, were of the class and kind of the working people. And I could not see them fighting their own fellows. I said so, but all I was told was, meaning by his superiors, was that discipline would do the trick. Yep, well, thought I, maybe it will and maybe it won't, but whoever is going to be caught between a mob on one side and a file of redcoats on the other, it isn't going to be me. The town of Paisley had been quiet enough when I was sent there, but the authorities <clears throat> had a suspicious eye on the whole area, which was regarded as being a hotbed of sedition. They were training up the, manil up the militia just in case, and this was the task I was given. An officer from a crack cavalry regiment instructing irregular infantry, which is what you might expect. They turned out to be good material, luckily. Many of, the elder, many of the older ones were Peninsular men, and the sergeant had been in the 42nd at Waterloo, so there was little enough for me to do at first. I was stationed on one of the principal mill owners of the area, so he was basically set up to protect one of these uh, high-ranking industrialists. Uh, that's what he's saying here. A brass-bound old money bags with a long nose and a hard eye who lived in some style in a house at Renfrew and who made me welcome after his fashion when I arrived. Again, I'm not going to attempt the Scottish accent. We've no high opinion of the military, sir, said he, and could well be doing without you. But since, thanks to slack government and that damnable reform nonsense, we're in this sorry plight, we must bear with having soldiers about us. A scandal. Do you see these wretches at my mill, sir? I would have the half of them in Australia this moment if it was left to me and let the rest feel their bellies pinched for a week or two we'd hear less of their caterwauling then 
I told him, you have, you need have no fear, sir. We shall protect you. He snorted, fear? I'm not afraid, sir. John Morrison does not tremble at the whine of his own workers, let me tell you. As for protecting, we shall see. And he gave me a look and a sniff. I was to live with the family. He could hardly do less in view of what brought me there. And presently he took me from his study through the gloomy hall of his mansion to the family's sitting room. The whole house was hellish gloomy and cold and smelled of must and righteousness. But when they threw open the sitting room door and ushered me in, I forgot my surroundings. <clears throat> Mr. Flashman, says he, this is Mistress Morrison and my four daughters, Agnes, Mary, Elizabeth, and Griselle. I snapped my heels and bowed with a great flourish. I was in uniform, and the gold-trimmed blue cape and pink pants of the 11th Hussars were already famous and looked extremely well on me. Four heads inclined in reply, and one nodded. This was Mistress Morrison, a tall, beak-nosed female in whom one could detect all the fading beauty of a vulture. I made a hasty inventory of the daughters, which I'm not going to go through uh, falling uh, on Elizabeth. Elizabeth was like none of the others. She was beautiful, fair-haired, blue-eyed, and pink-cheeked. And she alone smiled at me with the open, simple smile of the truly stupid. <clears throat> I marked her down at once and gave all my attention to Mistress Morrison. It was grim work, I may tell you, for she was a sour tyrant of a woman and looked on me as she looked on all soldiers, Englishmen, and men under 50 years of age as frivolous, godless, feckless, and unworthy. In this, it seemed, her husband supported her, and the daughter said not a word to me all evening. I could have damned a lot of them except Elizabeth, but instead I set myself to be pleasant, modest, and even meek where the old woman was concerned, and when we went into dinner, which was served in great state, she had thawed to the extent of a sour sm smile or two. <clears throat> you may wonder why I took pains to ingratiate myself with these Puritan boors, and the answer is that I have always made a point of being civil to anyone who might ever be of use to me. Also, I had half an eye to Miss Elizabeth, and there was no hope there without the mother's good opinion. Anyway, moving ahead, I want to do more about the, this workers' revolt. Uh, he, he's mainly falling in love with Elizabeth, uh, as you can tell. Um, However, there's many a slip twixt the crouch and the leap, as the cavalry used to say, and my difficulty was to get Miss Elizabeth in the right place at the right time. I was kept hard at it with the militia during the day, and in the evenings her parents chaperoned her like shadows. It was more for form's sake than anything else, I think, for they seemed to trust me well enough by this time but it made things damnably awkward, and I was beginning to itch for her considerably. But eventually, it was her father himself who brought matters to a successful conclusion and changed my whole life and hers, and it was because he, John Morrison, who had boasted of his fearlessness, turned out to be as timid as a mouse. It was on a Monday, nine days after I arrived, that a fracas broke out in one of the mills. A young worker had his arm crushed in one of the machines, and his mates made a great outcry about this, 
and a meeting of workmen was held in the streets beyond the mill gates. That was all. That was all. But some fool of a magistrate lost his head and demanded that the troops be called, quote, to quell the seditious rioters. I sent his messenger about his business in the first place because there seemed no danger to me from the meeting at all. Although there was plenty of fist shaking and threat shouting by all accounts, and in the second case because I do not make it a practice of seeking sorrow. Sure enough, the meeting, this, uh, this meeting of workers outside the mill gates after this uh, worker got his arm crushed in one of these, these uh, machines. Sure enough, the meeting dispersed, but not before the magistrate had spread panic and alarm, ordering the shops to close and windows in the town to be shuttered and God knows what other folly. I told him to his face that he was a fool, ordered my sergeant to let the, let the militia go home, and trotted over to Renfrew. There Morrison was in a state of despair. He peeped at me around the front door, his face ashen, and demanded, Are they coming in God's name? Why are you, <coughs> why are you not at the head of your troop, sir? Are we to be murdered for your neglect? <coughs> I told him pretty sharp that there was no danger, but that if there had been, his place was surely at his own mill to keep his rascals in order. He whinnied at me. I've seldom seen a man in such a fright, and being a true-bred poltroon myself, I speak with authority. My place is here, he yelped, defending my home and barns. Defending my home in, in, uh, in bairns. I guess bairns is a Scottish word for children. <clears throat> I thought they were in Glasgow today, I said, as I came into the hall. My wee Elizabeth is here, said he, groaning. If the mob was to break in... Oh, for God's sake, says I, for I was well out of sorts. What with the idiot magistrate and now Morriston, there is no mob. They've gone home. Will they stay home, he bawled. Oh, how they hate me, Mr. Flashman. Damn them all. What if they were to come here? Oh, woe is me and my poor wee Elizabeth. Poor wee Elizabeth was sitting in the window seat, admiring her reflection in the window panes, and perfectly unconcerned. Catching sight of her, I had an excellent thought. If you're nervous for her, why not send her to Glasgow too, I asked him, very unconcerned. Are you mad, sir? Alone on the road, a lassie? I, I reassured him I would escort his daughter safely to her mama. And leave me here, he cried. So I suggested he come as well, but he wouldn't have that. I realized later he probably had his strong box in the house. <clears throat> he hummed and hawed a great deal, but eventually fear for his daughter which was entirely groundless as far as mobs were concerned, overcame him, and we were packed off together in the gig, I driving, she humming gaily at the thought of a jaunt, and her devoted father crying instruction and consternation after us as we rattled off. Take care of of my poor wee lamb, Mr. Flashman, he wailed. To be sure, I will, sir, I replied. And to be sure, I did. And you can imagine how uh, our good man Flashman took care 
of the industrialist, beautiful wee lamb of a daughter, Elizabeth. Uh, so there you go. Anyway, hilarious reading, guys. Uh, I highly recommend the book Flashman. And since we have no power here in the collapse of global industrial civilization, I will probably have time to read the whole series. But for this, uh, you decide whether or not this was a doomsday sermon. This is your old preacher heading back to the Eco Lodge kitchen in desperate search for electricity. Because, of course, there's no solar panels at the Eco Lodge. I can hear the... Wait a minute. I cannot hear the various gas-powered generators off in the distance. Maybe global industrial civilization has returned, although my guess is the generators have just run out of gasoline. Bye, guys.